continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And last month, when Chief Judge Dennis Jacobs welcomed his colleagues on the federal bench to the Second Circuit's 2011 Judicial Conference, he described its theme as the legal brainscape, neuroscience and the law, thus advancing the rather sophisticated idea behind recent circuit conferences, namely, that developments in the law should be informed by the teachings of history and by knowledge of what is being learned in other disciplines and professions. Conference panels dealt with such neuroscience topics germane to judges and judging as predicting and exploring causation of criminal behavior, using neuroimaging to validate claims of chronic pain, ethical issues in neuroscience for lawyers and judges, and perhaps most important of all, the aging brain. Now, our good fortune today, of course, is that the distinguished member of the bar chosen to moderate that discussion of the aging brain was my friend Mark Zadera, a New York trial and appellate lawyer who has long now represented major corporations and prominent individuals in financial and commercial litigation in federal and state courts throughout the United States. And I've asked Mark, a frequent contributor to The Open Mind over the years, to share with us what was in truth the significance of his judicial panel's discussion of the aging brain. Mark, why the aging brain for the jurists? Well, let me say this. I'm not a scientist, and perhaps that's why this was such an eye-opener for me, and I was privileged to uh, moderate this panel with two of the world's leading scientists who are studying uh, the aging brain and other neuroscience issues. And I think to put this in context, there are two things we should think about, two factors that are in confluence right now that are important for all of us in society. One, the so-called baby boom generation is this year, the first wave of it, turning 65. We often define it as the generation that was born between 46 and 64. So there's going to be an enormous explosion of the aging population over the next couple of decades. Second, in general, people are healthier, they're living longer. And when people, or when the average age was 40 or 50, we didn't worry about or think about the aging brain as an important issue in society the way we are and we must today. Another phenomenon that's uh, helping to make this, uh, bringing it into focus for us, is technology. Uh, we have scan techniques that didn't exist 10 or 20 years ago, which actually allow us to see inside the brain and see the physiological changes that accompany normal aging and such uh, phenomena as dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and maybe we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So it touches all of us. It will touch all of us even more over the decades to come. I doubt there's anybody who's viewing this program that doesn't have some personal contact with the phenomenon of aging, family members, parents, grandparents, uh, even younger people. So it's an important issue for society and it touches us in, in so many areas of our life uh, and our society. And the particular importance for the judges? Well, the judges certainly have a, a professional, uh, if not parochial, interest in the subject. Um, our judicial system, our federal system, you know, we have life appointment of federal judges. 
uh, for very good reasons. Uh, it promotes the independence of the judiciary. In fact, one of the founders said at the time when the, when the Constitution was being constructed, uh, you know, old age is something we don't have to worry about. Um, we're not going to have a superannuated judiciary. Well, we didn't live changed. that long. We didn't live that long. Now, uh, one of the things that's happened, and I think the leaders in the judiciary deserve a lot of credit for this, um, they've taken cognizance of the fact that people age and we have diminished capacity over time. And there are many judges over 80, for example, uh, in the uh, federal system. Uh, one judge in the Seventh Circuit, the chief judge, has set up a voluntary reporting system to encourage judges to report uh, on themselves if they feel they're having difficulty coping, encouraging judges to talk about their colleagues, and of course uh, encouraging the bar to report instances where they feel that uh, judges need help or it should be brought to their attention. And one of the, one of the uh, realities of uh, the aging process is we don't always recognize in ourselves when we're undergoing those changes. So it's an important issue in the judiciary uh, where we have uh, people sometimes serving very constructively till 80, 90, and as we've seen in the paper, there's one judge over 100 years of age who's hearing cases. Um, so uh, it's an issue that's sort of ironic that uh, as we live longer, as we're healthier, we're also going to have statistically in the population a greater instance of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Maybe I should just clarify it, something that I learned in, in looking at this topic because we use these words very frequently. Dementia is, is a symptom. It can be caused by a number of neurological diseases. Alzheimer's is a specific disease. And we can see the signs of it now through imaging. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, we see deposits of a kind of what I guess they call it a plaque uh, that's in the, uh, in the system, which impedes the, the functioning of the neurons that are essential to, to the processes. Uh, in, uh, in Alzheimer's, these cells actually die. Uh, but even in the normal aging process, we see signs of diminishment of the brain that have effects in our daily life. You know, these. Uh, Cells have, in some cases, 20,000 uh, little dangling spines that are affected throughout our life. When we're under stress, we can actually see physical changes uh, in these spines. When we're younger, we tend to have a fast and effective recovery. Our ability to recover from stresses or other kinds of uh, assaults on, on, our, on our neurosystem diminishes uh, over time. And we can see that through imaging uh, techniques. So, it's an issue that's become important. We have the ability to see it. Of course, the terrible problem we have is we don't have a solution at this point. Well, I was going to ask you, if we have the ability to see it, are we going to look for it? And what was the impact of this insight upon the judges who were there at the conference? Well, I can't speak for the judges' uh, thoughts, but I can tell you that in this audience of 500 people, which included a couple of hundred judges, people were on the edge of their seats, uh, not because of my moderating, but because of the, the uh, points that were being made by these uh, distinguished scientists. Well, how do you feel about this notion of um, adopting, a, in a sense, a medical model uh, as you look at the judiciary? Isn't it possible if we have neuroimaging and we do. One of the panels itself dealt with neuroimaging. Are we going to get to the point, in your estimation, where we are going to have annual neuroimaging examinations of the judiciary? Yes. In fact, uh, one judge in Brooklyn, a distinguished uh, federal judge who's 89 or 90 years old, uh, judge Weinstein, has said that he uh, voluntarily uh, goes for an examination every year for a, a scan. Um, you know, that's certainly admirable, uh, but I think the key to, to addressing these issues is not simply what we see in the brain, but a change in societal, societal attitude. I think there's uh, been a, a negative connotation uh, attached uh, to uh, diminished capacity over time. It makes people uh, less willing to face it, uh, and I think we've seen this uh, in other situations. Uh, uh, psychological issues which were once hidden, not realized, and people uh, 
were ashamed or embarrassed about are things that are, that are addressed and talked about more commonly. And I think that these very natural changes that occur uh, in, in the human brain and the behavior that goes with it uh, are things that will be recognized and dealt with more easily when society accepts these changes as a normal part of life and aging. Yes, but what can the judiciary, and let's focus on okay. your friends, the judges. Uh, we've talked here once some years ago about uh, retirement, forced retirement, not of judges, but of lawyers in the major firms. What's the approach that can be taken here? There are administrative measures that can be taken. Remember, under the Constitution, uh, the judge serves for life during good behavior. Right. Nobody would suggest, I think, that uh, getting that, old that is bad, bad behavior. Bad behavior, right. Uh, I'll testify to that one. Okay. It's a, I think that's a, uh, very cogent. But um, the judges who administer the courts uh, have the ability to take assignments of cases uh, away. Uh, some judges, for example, who have uh, exhibited diminished capacity have been given only certain kinds of cases that don't require them, for example, to preside over a courtroom. Uh, they'll decide social security uh, appeals or other kinds of cases that can be done from chambers with the assistance of staff. Now, of course, you can raise questions about whether or not it's appropriate to have any judge sit as a judge who has full Article III constitutional responsibilities with diminished capacity being handled administratively to adjust the assignment to the ability of the judge. But there are informal pressures that operate too. Uh, but informal ju procedures generally aren't worth the paper they're not written on. Well, you know, much, much of, the, uh, of the way judges uh, function is based on their own sense of uh, propriety, uh, their own sense of responsibility. They're given great freedom. And, uh, you know, if colleagues say to somebody, look, uh, you've got an issue here, you've got to face it, uh, the, the evidence is that most judges respond to that, perhaps not immediately, uh, but over time. I remember there was an issue that was written about, uh, about Justice Douglas, I recall, uh, in, the, in his last years about whether or not he was fully competent. He stayed on. Some felt that he stayed on longer than he should have. Um, but uh, by and large, uh, the evidence is that people who experience uh, diminished capacity recognize it at some point and either through administrative measures or through their own recognition deal with it uh, by retirement. Uh, or there's an intermediate step for judges which is called senior status, which a judge who has served a certain number of years and has reached a certain age, there's a formula for determining that formula of 80, combination of the number of years you've been on the bench and your age equals 80, you're entitled to take senior status, which entitles you to maintain all of the emoluments of office, but to have a reduced caseload. And that's the point where often much jiggering goes on in terms of what cases a judge will have. And, and the reality is that certain kinds of cases are more taxing physically uh, and uh, intellectually uh, than other cases, and adjustments can be made. So it has been somewhat successful. If you look at the profession and you look at the judiciary throughout the country, not just one federal circuit, but all the state courts too, what's going on in them? What's going on in the variety of states that obviously all of them have to deal with this problem? Yeah, in, in states it's not so much of a problem because most states have a mandatory retirement age. 70 is typical. In fact, New York State uh, has a mandatory retirement age of 70. Uh, trial judges, not, not those on the highest court, the New York Court of Appeals, but other judges, trial judges and those on the intermediate appellate courts, can be certified uh, for three, up to three, two-year terms after age 70, so they can serve to 76. But that's it. At that point, uh, there's, there's a mandatory retirement. But the certification process involves a look at the judge in terms of their well-being, their physical and, and mental capabilities, so there's a monitoring process. But in the judiciary, it's much more of an issue in the federal judiciary because of the, uh, the lifetime tenure. What about the other side of the coin, Mark? Um, uh, as an old, old, old man, I have to ask whether there was 
any uh, effort to look at the pluses that are associated with uh, long life, long experience on the bench. That's, that's an excellent point. And, and that's, a, that's something that's true for judges, for lawyers, and for, for others as well. There's the issue of judgment, experience. You know, the thought process is, is a complex one. It involves a kind of uh, mixing or conflation of uh, experience, of uh, intellectual acuity, uh, of unconscious filtration. And I'll give you an example, whether it's a judge or a lawyer. I, I know many instances where I've seen lawyers sit around and talk about the strategy of a case, and there'll be younger lawyers, middle-aged lawyers, and old lawyers. Uh, and the decision has to be made about what to do. You have a complex set of facts. You have any number of legal principles that may be applicable to the dispute at hand and, and argued. And the older lawyer seems, in many cases, to have the ability to sort through that, to separate the wheat from the chaff, to know intuitively through experience, judgment from all of the things that have been learned and all of the experiences that have been had over the years to pick the right course. And sometimes they're asked to explain it, and sometimes it's difficult to explain. It's, a, it's intuition, it's judgment. It's very much analogous to what we see in medicine, I think. And I've heard, heard doctors say this, that they will take a young intern on the rounds and they'll see a symptom and it could be any number of things. And the uh, protocol may prescribe a certain number of screening procedures to get to what it is by process of elimination. And the experienced doctor knows intuitively which way to look. The younger doctor does not. And it's difficult to explain. Uh, so there are advantages to age. You know, the mind has been compared to a symphony orchestra. And this was uh, one of the uh, experts who, who, who made this, I think, very apt analogy. Uh, you know, you have many sections. Well, the string section may step out. They may, may, the violins don't work. But the orchestra goes on. And the mind has many compartments. And it functions in many different ways. So we may experience a diminution in, in capacity in one area, but we compensate for it by uh, proceeding in other areas. We forget a word, we forget, but so we find another word. We talk around it. Uh, we know we're forgetting the word, so we, in speaking, find another word that, that's a synonym. Uh, we forget a name. Well, we don't speak about the name of the person. We talk about his role or his position instead of saying, Mr. Jones, we said, well, you know, the president of such and such university. These things are done automatically throughout our, our daily life, so we compensate. So our ability to compensate uh, and uh, our enhanced judgment that accompanies age, uh, I think, serves us well. I noticed in reading the materials you were so kind as to share with me that uh, one of the differential, um, uh, one of the things by which you differentiate between uh, the importance of the aging pro uh, uh, process and when it is not all that important is when you're dealing with criminal cases. And I thought to myself, my God, yes. Uh, now, are judges more likely to um, have the criminal cases removed from their uh, supervision? Well, that, that, that's an interesting issue. Uh, well, first, I, I, I thought you were touching upon, uh, which is, I think, an important issue, uh, is the issue of responsibility in the criminal law that individuals have. You know, we have traditionally in our uh, judicial system uh, not punished people who don't have the mental capacity to understand mm -hmm. right from wrong or in tests that were developed more recently in this century have irresistible impulses but we haven't really focused much because we haven't known much about it which is diminished capacity that comes about from aging or Alzheimer's as opposed to perhaps the more easily recognizable uh, psychiatric disorders that are very obvious in fact, at this conference, there was uh, one example that was discussed uh, uh, was quite interesting uh, of a, a middle-aged professional man who uh, uh, had no history of any difficulties, suddenly uh, couldn't control his behavior and was uh, sexually harassing people uh, uh, in his uh, environment and very openly. And, um, and an examination was done. They found a large tumor. And they removed the tumor, and uh, the behavior stopped. There was no problem. It reoccurred several years later, the tumor was back, and on and on and on. So this was just one example of how 
changes in the brain can affect behavior and it can uh, become an issue in the criminal law process as well. We've really not studied that and our law has not yet really developed uh, to address issues of diminished capacity as it relates to responsibility for antisocial behavior. But the suggestion is made in the choice of topics for this conference, neuroimaging, that this is going to be a factor in the law. I think it will be, it will be. You know, uh, we like to be optimistic and uh, the scientists were asked by members of the audience, well with all this imaging and the information that we now have about how the brain functions, are we going to find a cure? And when are we going to find a cure? And the scientists said, you know, for 25 years they've been saying the cure is five years from now. And I don't feel, they said, we can predict that. The but cure for the disease for the of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, for the, the various diseases that cause dementia, but in particular Alzheimer's. And uh, what they are confident of is that there will be a cure, but when there will be, they don't know. Right now we have palliatives, but we don't have a cure for it. You know, there are ethical issues I just want to mention here that I, I, I think are an important part of our thinking about this issue with Alzheimer's and related diseases. Um, you know, for less than $1,000, you and I can go on the internet and uh, find a company that will give us a test. We can deposit some saliva and send it in. And it will tell you whether or not you have a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's. And if you have a particular gene or gene variation, they, you have a 25% enhanced risk of getting Alzheimer's. Now, should doctors tell their patients to get that test? What do you do with that information? Can it have negative impacts, your ability to get insurance, for example? Is it, is it worthwhile doing? And what is the doctor's responsibility here? Those are very, very important issues. Uh, these may be matters of personal choice. Perhaps doctors should tell people what their options are because you know, one argument is if we know our predisposition, it can help us plan. Um, what we find, and this is another uh, point where I think uh, imaging is important, we see signs of dementia, of Alzheimer's in particular, before we see the symptoms. We see it in the imaging of the brain. Uh, most scientists say that if we are going to find a medical a solution with medical intervention, it's going to have to be applied before the symptoms have developed, and that the key will be to uh, engaging in medical intervention early. Danger, danger, danger. Isn't there a great danger, for instance, that in before the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate, which must confirm the nominations of the President of the United States to the federal bench, that tests will be required. Uh, that's saliva tests, whatever tests you're talking about. That's, that's Did this come up, this kind of concern? Well, that is one of the ethical concerns. Uh, what do we do with the prevalence of the information or uh, a society that seems to want to investigate uh, these issues in, in circumstances where people are appointed to public positions, for example? Should we, should we uh, require that uh, of presidential candidates? I don't, there's nothing in the Constitution that would require it, but I don't know, legislatively, uh, uh, Congress might, uh, might pass such a law that candidates should uh, undergo such a test. I, I don't know whether that would be constitutional, but I could see it coming. Well, you see what I want to tease from you, and maybe it's not fair because you practiced before uh, the judges uh, before whom you moderated this panel uh, a couple of months ago. What do you sense is there um, their feeling about this? What are their concerns, their fears, their anticipations? My impression is they're very open to learning more about it. They, they are. I think, uh, by and large, they tend to be open-minded. I mean, they have strong views about issues, but they're intellectually curious. They are trained to listen objectively to information. And my impression was they are open to learning more about it. Uh, the questions they asked uh, indicated they want to know more about it. So I, I'm optimistic that this kind of uh, dialogue that takes place is very useful for them and then in turn useful for, for all of us who, who have cases as clients uh, before the courts. 
I want to mention one other thing that came up at the conference that I think, I think is of interest. You know, Alzheimer's is not an equal opportunity disease in that uh, it may affect females more than males. Um, part of the research uh, involves um, the effects of menopause, uh, estrogen levels. Uh, one of the scientists pointed out that in 1900, the average age of a female in this country was 52, and the, age of, the average age of onset of menopause was 52. Today, the average age of onset of menopause is 52, but the average lifespan is 81. So now we've got, on average, an additional 30-year period for the effects to take hold, as, the, as they may, if there are reduced estrogen levels. That's one of the areas uh, of research that's being undertaken right now. Of course, just as we um, find there's little time left, I would raise the question, based on what you have just said, is there any indication in terms of the bench, in terms of the courts, that uh, the negative impact of aging has affected um, judges who are women more than judges who are men? I don't know of any study that's addressed that, so I couldn't make that assessment. But anecdotally, I want to just mention uh, there was a very prominent case, and I thought it was a very courageous thing. There was a Court of Appeals judge, a woman, uh, who was appointed to the bench at age 40 and uh, at age 54, a relatively early age, developed Alzheimer's, thought about continuing, and made a public statement that she didn't want to uh, jeopardize the litigants before her. She was 54, had Alzheimer's, and she was resigning from the bench, even though she was quite, at that point, uh, obviously in command of her faculties. So I thought that was uh, very courageous. Mark Zadora, thank you for discussing this issue with us. Thank you. Come back to the open mind again. Thank you very much. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you'll join us again next time. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other Open Mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash openmind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.